Hi everyone, my name is Trace Meredith. Um, I'm a product designer at Dropbox. I work on the mobile growth team uh, and I'm so thrilled to be able to speak to you today. So thank you so much for coming and listening. Uh, this is my talk, Designing for Neurodiversity. Uh, I thought I would just start off the talk with kind of a personal story. Um, so for everyone who doesn't know, I have dyslexia um, and that you know, makes me navigate the world a little differently than some other people. Uh, my dyslexia really affects my ability to spell, among other things. Uh, but spelling really is the hardest thing. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I have to spell a lot of words on the internet nowadays. And when I do, uh, I usually use Google to search those words. And more often than not, I am greeted with a lovely screen like this, um, where I type something in and I get no results simply because the word I spelled, it, Google's just not even able to recognize um, what I was trying to get. Uh, I probably see this screen maybe three or four times a day, which is uh, embarrassing to admit. One of my favorite things about this screen is the first bullet where it says, make sure all your words are spelled correctly. That usually makes me have a face like this um, because I have really hit a dead end in this experience. So what I typically do next is just Google spell checker. Click on the first result, whatever they are. Usually it looks something like this, you know, some sort of third party website. Um, I love all of them. Honestly, they all work so well. Uh, I put that word that I searched in Google right into an interface like this. I translate it. Um, but because my dyslexia also affects my ability to read, what I typically do then to make sure that this word uh, is the actual word I was trying to look up or spell, um, I go back to Google and then I plug in what was spell checked for me. Uh, I like to do this because Google has a feature where I can just press a little button and have uh, the word spoken to me and I also have a definition there so I can make sure without a doubt that this word is the one I was trying to spell or what I was trying to look up. Now, I hope this little story uh, has frustrated you as much as made you laugh, um, it, but it really is my you know, personal experience. And I think this, uh, this process that I have to go through is really why I um, am doing this talk and what inspired me to, do the, uh, to give, you know, to talk to you all today, and I hope that this story can also uh, inspire you to make sure your products are not um, as difficult to use as this experience I had. Uh, so for the rest of the talk, uh, I'm just gonna start off and give you some context um, about neurodiversity, accessibility, what I'm talking about. I'm then gonna get into some actionable things that you can incorporate into your product or experience, and then I wanna talk about the future and what I hope to see um, in the near term. So yeah, let's start off with some context. Uh, I just want to I want to talk about what I think of as neurodiversity, what it means, um, and what it means to be neurodiverse. I really think the easiest explanation for this is that um, neurodiversity is sort of the mismatch between society's expectations of how your brain is supposed to work and the reality of how your brain actually works, right? So for me, uh, society really dictates that we need to be excellent spellers, right? We need to have sort of 100% grammar and spelling at all times, but in reality, that's just not how my brain works and I'm not able to meet that standard. And so that's why I consider myself to be neurodiverse. I think you can apply that same logic in you know, any situation that you're in, any situation or ability how you define uh, yourself as neurodiverse, it's really just the mismatch between expectations and reality. Uh, this brings me to just a really quick definition of what I consider neurodiversity to be. I think there's you know, no right or wrong answer here. There's a lot of definitions uh, that you could have. But for me, I like to think of it as there's just no right way to think or learn or behave. Um, there's no one right way that your brain should function, right? Or that you should be. And that whatever way you are, whatever differences you have, whatever mismatch you have between society's expectations and uh, the way your brain works, those things should be recognized, they should be celebrated, we should be designing for them, 
um, they should be more than accommodated, right? They should be, you should be rewarded for the strengths that you have and really celebrated for those things. Uh, I'd love to hear your guys' definitions for neurodiversity. Anyone who's watching wants to chime in. Um, I think it's, you know, it's hard to define and there's absolutely no one right description. So when thinking about uh, what neurodiverse people need, I think maybe a lot of people are here to learn how they can help, right? How they can design for people like me. I think there's two, uh, two sides of the same coin, basically. The first, one, the first thing that I think we need is what I'm calling access, uh, which is, I think, boiled down really sort of digital accessibility. So this is providing users with sort of essential engagement in your product, right? So they can um, navigate, they can use your features, they can log in, you know, they can do the sort of table stakes things that every website and every person using a website needs to do, right? And they can do those things without burden. The other side of the coin uh, is something I like to call success. Uh, and I think if you boil this down, you can sort of think of it as inclusive design or more on the inclusive design spectrum, right? And so this is that users can have really valuable engagement with your product, right? So they can not only navigate around, but they can understand and achieve the value you're trying to bring them, right? They can have a meaningful experience and build strong proficiency with these products. Uh, and for my talk today, I really want to focus on this success piece, right? Um, I definitely have some more thoughts on access, and we'll get into that. But I, uh, specifically, I think from my point of view, what I can offer today is some really detailed advice on how to design a successful experience. So let's look into that, right? So what, what would a successful user experience look like? Or what would a user experience look like that's designed for, specifically for success? Um, I've got a few tips and tricks, a couple of guidelines for you um, that I'm going to go over. Awesome. So the first one um, is that your experience should be abundant, right? And so I like to, my little subhead here is additional workflows increase usability, right? So the more the merrier here. Uh, the first example that I have is from Asana. If you're not familiar, Asana is a task management, project management software. And they have really built into their core product multiple views of ways to manage your work, your task, your goals, whatever you're putting in there. Right? Part of their core experience is that you can see those things as a board, as a list, as a timeline, on a calendar. right? Uh, some people might think that all of these different views are maybe a little redundant, but I really like to think of them as abundant. So the, whatever type of person you are, whatever way you're thinking, whatever makes the most sense for you and your team, you can visualize your work that way with Asana, which I think is so impressive. Um, and I'm so excited to see all the new um, views that they'll develop in the future. Uh, I think the Asana example is a really big uh, right, like core feature example, lots of complexity there. And I wanted to like really, really uh, zoom in on a very small way that you can bring abundance to your interface, right? Um, so this is a modal from Pinterest when you're creating a new board. And the thing I absolutely love about this modal is it has a close button in the bottom left and in the top right. Uh, now these buttons essentially do the same thing, right? There's a cancel button. It'll stop this workflow, close the modal. The X at the top will also do the same thing. Um, this is probably my favorite example in my talk today because it's so simple, but yet it actually will help anyone who, uh, who's using this modal who needs to get out of it. They don't have to think, oh, where's the close button, right? It's in two spots that these buttons are commonly placed, so people will easily be able to find them and achieve their goal. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've had this discussion with fellow designers where they think, again, this, this, uh, these two buttons are a little redundant. But I think that a certain amount of redundancy can really just help people, right? I don't think any user will look at this modal, notice both close buttons, and be offended or disappointed, right? I think it will only help them achieve their goals faster and with less frustration. Awesome. The next. Uh, the next principle I want to introduce is that your interfaces should be forgiving, right? We should be forgiving users. 
The first example I have comes from Gmail. I absolutely love both of these things. I can't talk about them enough. Um, the first one is that you can simply undo an email that is sent, right? I don't know how many of us have sent emails that we regret, but Gmail finally, you know, has a feature that we can change our minds very quickly. Super useful, easy, and helpful. Uh, on, uh, even, in even more detail, they're helping us um, before we send as well with the forgot attachment alert. I don't know who else benefits from this. I hope everybody watching, but I constantly forget to attach things uh, to emails before I send them, and this alert gives me some feedback before I send to make sure that um, I you know, wrote attachment and didn't mean to attach something, or it helps remind me if I forgot um, to go back and attach it. I think um, both of these examples, you could say, perhaps are unnecessary or maybe add more friction to the user experience. But at the same time, they forgive users and make them feel safe and comfort them that if they do happen to do something wrong, there are ways to fix and remedy those things. Uh, my next example comes from Dropbox. Uh, this is my absolute favorite feature of Dropbox. I use it constantly at work. Um, and it is the deleted files and version history feature. All right, so on Dropbox, you can easily navigate to this tab in the main navigation and look back, see all your deleted files and version history of those files. I think um, this really puts, this really creates like a competitive advantage for Dropbox because they are positioning themselves as a really forgiving storage platform, right? They're not the trash can on your desktop that if you empty, everything's gone forever. Um, when you store things with Dropbox, you just don't have to worry about that, right? They have really taken a bold approach to forgiving their users and allowing them to have access to their deleted files, right? Again, I think this is a feature that Dropbox could easily have never built, right? They don't. Uh, they don't have to have this. But because they want to optimize workflows, because they're thinking about their users and their feelings, they want to forgive them. They want uh, to make sure that everyone storing files there can make a mistake and come back. Uh, and I think these, this example is just the best, one of the best that I've seen um, for forgiveness. Awesome. The third and last principle I want to go over is to, that your product should be nurturing, right? And for this, I like to think of it as that uh, a lot of us make tools that other people make stuff in, right? You might work on a document editor or a video editor. Um, and the better we make those tools, the better things people will create in them. So my first example is my personal favorite product in the world, Grammarly. Uh, whom I, I mean, their keyboard has truly just saved my life. And everyone that I text benefits so much from me having access to this. But Grammarly really took like one feature from traditional word processing, right? It's that little red zigzag line under the words that you misspell. And they uh, made it like the Disneyland of spell check, right? They are so um, thoughtful. They are very concise, consistent, and rigorous in presenting you helpful information uh, for word processing and editing, right? They really uh, thought of this idea of nurturing, right? They give you suggestions. They not only correct you, but they help you learn about why they're correcting you. There's options to give them feedback on their corrections. Uh, there is just so many more features than a traditional word processor, right? And because of this, any writing that's done in Grammarly is obviously just going to be of a higher quality, or there's going to be more thought put into it because users have this very, very comprehensive experience in front of them. Um, again, I think other word processing products could have taken this approach, right? They could have had these features built into them, but Grammarly really said, let's, let's be nurturing. Let's nurture our users and make that our core value proposition, uh, which is something that I think uh, we all benefit from. My uh, next example comes from TikTok. 
uh, and it is their auto captions and then the ability to edit those auto captions. So I don't know how much, how much time y'all spend on TikTok. For me, it's probably like an hour a day. And you might have noticed um, in the past couple months that there are uh, closed captions that you can um, turn on and off while you're watching your videos. Well, TikTok actually introduced a feature where creators, people making videos on their platform, can just tap a button and captions are automatically generated to those, um, to those videos. Now, I think we would all say like that's impressive enough, right? That's really cool technology. It's a super simple and easy user experience just to be able to tap a button and bam, there's captions. Uh, but they took it one step further, which is really the thing I want to call out about the genius of this feature, which is that they allow you to then, once the captions are generated, to then go into what they've auto-generated for you and edit them, right? So if they've made a mistake, uh, if you want to rephrase or re-clarify something, they give you that power, right? And so this, uh, this feature really nurtures uh, accurate but also very expressive closed captioning for anyone who's making a TikTok video, right? They are uh, actively allowing you to say what you mean, and they are actively nurturing better videos, better closed captioning through this product experience. It's one of my favorite things to use when I make TikToks. Um, it's, it's, it's really a magical thing to experience. Awesome. So thank you so much um, for listening to my principles. And I want to shift gears a little bit now and just talk about um, the future, the world that I see, and the world that I would really like to get to. So um, going back to those two concepts that I started with of access and success, I think right now in our industry, um, access is really trending, which makes me so happy. Right. I'm, I'm thrilled that to see more designers, engineers, product people care about accessibility um, in a deep enough way uh, that it has really become sort of an essential skill set or table, sa table stakes functionality that every product needs to have. It's really exciting. Um, but talking th to my um, friends and colleagues in the industry who are actively working in accessibility or who are accessibility designers, um, their teams are really focused on compliance right now, right? Which is uh, honestly a wonderful thing. I'm so grateful that we have laws and we have um, guidelines and legislation that require tools, digital tools on the internet to reach a certain level of accessibility. It's, it's, it's mind boggling. I wouldn't have, like, I would have never guessed that that would have been the case years and years ago. Um, but these teams, uh, I think are really focused, they're really focused on compliance for that business case, right? And what I would really like to see in the future is that they're able to balance this need for compliance and access, but also be able to focus on success, right? So any team out there that's working on accessibility right now, I really want, I really hope this talk will empower your team to think outside of just compliance and start thinking about how you can make your product um, more forgiving, more abundant, more, or nurture um, other content. I think you know we're just barely scratching the surface, sort of with accessibility design or inclusive design um, in you know at scale for different products. And so I am, uh, I really hope to see more features like the ones that I talked about today incorporated to a larger audience um, and, and really see these teams as they are starting to form um, really take on a personal, vo personal voice and a bold opinion and stance of what an accessibility team and accessibility designers can do and should do. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Again, my name is Trace Meredith. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at BabyTrace. Uh, I also write a newsletter uh, called Designing for Neurodiversity that I'd love to see you subscribe to, where I talk um, about what you heard today, but in a lot more detail. Uh, yeah, so thanks, everyone.